Episode 58 of the Owl Triangle is here and business is a booming in Irish mixed martial arts. Delighted to be joined by Andy Stevenson, Quilcha de Barra for the latest episode. We have much to discuss. Andy, you keeping well? I'm great. I was out to a quarter past two in the morning there uh, last night, but uh, apart from that, I'm feeling pretty good. Get your chest licked. No comment. No, no, Quilcha no, yourself. No, absolutely not. <laughs> 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 Quilcha, how are you, my friend? How are you keeping? Good. good now. Fresh legs. I'm not sure if you could say the same, but uh, feeling good. Definitely not fresh legs over here. Anyway, I ran a fucking ten k this morning, and my legs are in bits now. But uh, I was saying to Quilcha, actually, I had a funny story. So anyone that wants to kind of do themselves the honors of checking out the video on YouTube, I don't know whether you're listening on it, but you can see my haircut, and I got absolutely butchered during the week. But it's a funny story. So I went into the guy. I know he probably doesn't look that way here. It looks look, a hell of a lot. Think it looks good, to be honest with you. Ah, uh, it's a little bit too short for my liking now, where it was like, anyway, I'll tell you the story. So I went in to get the haircut, um, and I joked with the barber that I normally get the, the haircut with. I was like, yeah, I'm running the 10K. I was like, give me a nice tight cut there now. Um, it'll make me go faster in the race. Joking, right? So um, he went on and did his thing, and then he asked me, he was like, did we get the razor out the last time? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I think we did. I think we did. So I went on and I just zone out, right, for the haircut. You know, I'm not like, I'm not really small talk or anything like that. And I think that suits the barber as well. He goes in, tucks in. Next thing, I kind of was daydreaming, thinking about other shit. And next thing he comes through with the, like, with the little buzzer, um, like get the clean shaven ones, say. And next thing I see him rattling in the back of my head. And I'm like, hold on a minute. I didn't get this on the, the last time, <laughs> but it was because I thought when he went to razor is the little trimmers. You know, you give it the little trimmers, and I get a tight cut before. So he had like the, the blade, like the nineteen twenties stuff. Oh no, no, it wasn't even the blade. It was the, like the little kind of electric, you know, circular um, oh, shaver yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, but like he was going to like it was fucking sore. It was sore getting it done. But he had gone two or three, and it was too late. I was like, fuck him after fucking up here big time. And he went to town on it for. Um, for about fucking five or ten minutes, got the fade in. All right, it's not doesn't look too bad, but when I put the the hand on the back of my head when it was done, like I never held the back of my head as bald in my life, and I was like, "Oh man, this is way too much." So I was real. When you when you touch it and your hand sticks to it a little bit, it sticks to it. <laughs> it's like really smooth, and I'm like, "Oh my god, what is that?" And then I go halfway up, and I can feel a bit of hair from the fade, and I and it just felt really bad. I think it looked a little bit better than it failed but that was kind of my a funny little story I, I definitely cannot daydream anymore when I'm getting my hair cut because uh, yeah it uh, doesn't help things out and it didn't make me go faster either that's, that's what I was going to ask <laughs> it didn't make me go faster at all but enough shy talk let's get into it boys starting off big UFC press conference uh, announced for June the 2nd 4th June 4th uh, in the Tree Arena in Dublin, Conor June McGregor, the Michael, June the 3rd, there we right. go, June the 3rd, thanks guys, Bank Holiday Monday, Michael Chandler flying over, Conor McGregor will be there, um, in an assumingly packed Tree Arena, maybe that's the first question, do we expect this to be somewhat of a sellout there, it is a pretty big occasion to bring uh, a press conference over, it hasn't been done um, since, you know, the Conor and Aldo fight years and years ago, obviously we, we, we speak to Nate the Great Kelly about that a little bit later on but um, you know I think it's a good move um, it could potentially be a bad move it's going to be hard to know what kind of wildness is going to present itself at this press conference Andy your initial thoughts there was a certain lot of rumours I know PT was talking about a little bit as well and uh, you know it was confirmed on Friday last by Dana White along with the news, obviously, of Ian Gary MVP as well, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. But your initial reactions, Andy, on the press conference, first of all? I think that it's going to be... I think it'll inject a good bit of energy. Uh, it's been a long time since the UFC brand has been in Ireland. Um, so like, I think it'll bring out a crowd, certainly, like Connor always does. Now, I think it'll be... I really don't know. I, like I, I, I find it very difficult to to figure this out. Like, on one hand, it could be like just like twenty fifteen, and like a big boisterous crowd willing Connor on, you know, hurling abuse at Michael Chandler. 
But it's a very different time in MMA in Ireland than it used to be. It's a very different time in Conor McGregor's career than it used to be. Um, and the casual fan base that he once had has probably shifted and changed a lot over the past ten year, or nine years. Um, but that being said, more than likely, you'll, you'll probably have a, a boisterous crowd. It'll be interesting to see if they allow fans to ask questions. I think that will dictate whether it'll be similar to last time. I don't think that it'll be the same kind of uh, venom towards Michael Chandler as it was towards Jose Aldo back back when um, when you have you know Connor's not going for a title. It's just different from a, it's not the same sport and merit um, as the Aldo one was. So um, I'm very curious. I will be there. I'm going. Um, I'm ho- I think I'll, I'll hopefully see Quilter de Barra there too, and we'll miss you there, Ian. But uh, yeah, two hundred three day, two hour three ain't bad. That's what Meatloaf said anyway. Yeah, I guess so. Exactly. Um, yeah, I would wish to be to be there if it was an event. I think if it was a UFC Dublin event, I'd probably look to travel back. But I'm, you know, I can't really make it happen. Uh, obviously, uh, be coming home in July, of course, and, and August, and getting married. But uh, a little bit too soon for me, even to get down I mean, to the fight. Uh, yeah, that's it. We're all yeah. falling like flies. Congrats to I, Sean Sheen. Yeah. Congratulations, Mr. Sean yeah. Sheen. Yeah, absolutely. But um, yeah, that means Quilch yeah. is next. I think. Quilch is definitely <laughs> next. Twenty-seven. Leave me alone, lads. <laughs> yeah, Please. Quilch. With the press conference, uh, maybe to round it off a little bit, chit chat, and obviously we'll we'll talk about it after it happens as well. He's got a good dance partner here, Michael Chandler. Obviously, look at you had a little bit of the language barrier. Jose Aldo, not known for being outspoken. Um, you know, Michael Chandler, I think, will lap up any negativity, will lap up any positivity that comes his way. Although I think it'll be very, very little positivity that would be coming his way in Dublin. But, you know, it could make for a very, very interesting 30 to 40 minutes uh, with the press conference as well. Are uh, you looking forward to it? I am, yeah. It's like, you know, didn't really have much plans for a bank holiday Monday and I don't think many people really would. It's usually a bit of a down day, but now this is what makes me think that it'll get a good crowd. It's A, McGregor. B, it's a bank holiday Monday. People look for things to do. It's really, it's something exciting and there's not really much usually happening on a kind of a bank holiday Monday. So, yeah, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. In that sense, really curious now as to how it'll go down like similar to Andy what type of crowd will be there I'm very I'm speaking to you guys about it. I'm interested in what type of media turns up will we get will it be very predominantly Irish media who will show up from that uh, will there be people coming from abroad uh, there's a lot because it is very it's quite short notice as well for people to be arranging travel over to come to a press conference if they're come from America UK or elsewhere in Europe and the world so uh, I'm interested in that perspective and what they do uh, with the press conference in general uh, I was listening to the crack and I was just, uh, there recently with Andy and Pizzi and I think there was a mention of the uh, ho- you know, of having other was it other other Irish fighters in UFC come on and do a bit as well and that's probably not going to be the case maybe but it's something I would definitely would have loved to see uh, so uh, yeah besides all that I am quite looking forward to it it'll be a very interesting time yeah the opportunity is there really uh, you know I think you know and I know you said it on repeat as well I actually had the same thoughts myself um, you know great opportunity to fly Ian Gary over here great opportunity to have the likes of Sean and Kaelin and, and Kiefer all competing on UFC 304 um, you know we've had press conferences where we've had fighters from different events going on it so the fact that it's a, a 303 press conference shouldn't really tie the UFC down. Now, what we want and what we'll get is probably going to be very different. Dif- uh, different. I don't imagine, I haven't heard that, you know, anyone has reached out to any of uh, the other pro fighters in, in, in terms of Sean Kiefer or, or Kalen to be on that press conference. But, Jesus, I think that would be great for, for them and just for, you know, to showcase the, the talent there within Irish mixed martial arts as well. So, be interesting to see what develops there. I'm not saying, like, it's impossible that it doesn't happen. But uh, the likelihood of it would be very, very minimum. Andy, along with the announcement of the UFC Dublin press conference, we also got the announcement that on the same card, Ian Gary will take on Michael Venom Page. Absolutely cracking fight. Um, my, I, I tweeted about this. My excitement level was surprisingly high and not surprisingly high for any other reason that I was just surprised that the fight took like kind of was put together and I was surprised at how excited I was when I saw 
the two of them, you know, on the poster and they're, they're, they're matched up with each other. And, you know, it's a really intriguing fight. And it's, you know, you said it, we, we were all kind of talking about it as well. We mentioned two things on, on the podcast when we were talking about, obviously, the fact and the importance of Ian being on that 303 card. And number two, you know, the level of doubt that we had that Colby Covington was going to take the fight. He didn't. MVP stepped up, but we've got a belter of a fight and a belter of a placement as well with Ian Gary. I would assume he's a, he was announced as the co-main event for that too, wasn't he? Or is that still? Um, ooh, uh, I don't maybe know. Not, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think Ulberg was given the co-main event. Yeah, Ulberg, yeah. Ulberg yeah. versus Hill will probably still serve as the co-main event, but nonetheless, an excellent addition to the card, Ian Gary MVP. We we've talked about this. Uh, the L Triangle listeners, you guys know, we said it's way way more important for Ian to be on the Connor card than it is for him to fight Colby Covington. And this is like the, I would have had Colby as the the ideal scenario, but him aside, a fight versus MVP from a name perspective, you know, at, when you consider that he was really really struggling to get matched here, and it looked like it wasn't going to happen, and it was going to be a case that. You had this brilliant opportunity for Ian to finally get to share a card with his idol. You know, Connor does not fight very frequently anymore. Ho- hopefully that will change, but it's been a long time coming this. So for that opportunity to slip by would have been worst case scenario for Ian, where you don't get the fight with Colby and you don't get on the Connor card. So to go in here against Michael Venom Page, who is, you know, very widely known, especially on the UK and Irish scene, um, and obviously now in, in the UFC, it's huge. And look, I I would actually lean towards the, the two of yourselves for the, the technical breakdown. Not that we're going to give it right now, but my reaction to it was kind of like, this is a huge, huge fight. I think it'll get me really, really excited. I'll be on the edge of my seat as it goes to play out because I don't know how it will. I don't know who, you know, will necessarily win because it's it's the, the toughest test I would say that Ian will have faced in his career to date. But I, 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 a part of me can't help but feel like I don't know if this is going to be the fight that the fans are expecting and I don't know if this will be a very tentative fight like we saw the likes of when Darren Till and Wonderboy fought a number of years ago. I'm really hoping I'm wrong, but a, a part of me is kind of very fearful that it'll turn into a bit of a, you know, tactical, slow uh, technician type fight where, you know, it, it's probably not going to be the bloodbath yeah. that people are wanting. No, no, definitely not. Like, I mean, when you're talking about two technical strikers, Krilsha, you know, there are no two better technical strikers, in my opinion, in the welterweight division other than Ian Gary and MVP. Obviously, you could throw the likes of Stephen Wonder by Thompson in there as well. But, you know, this is this kind of a style fight and and a name value fight that Ian had been calling for with Stephen Wonder by Thompson. He gets it in terms of MVP, a guy coming in with a lot of hype, coming in off a good win. And it should be an interesting technical strike and battle. I'm curious to hear, you know, maybe your quick thoughts on, on breakdown between the two of these guys. If I was to kind of label it and package it up, I think that, you know, Ian's success in this fight depends on how he approaches this fight. If he approaches it as a straight striking match, you know, we're going to have a close technical fight, in my opinion. But is he, if he approaches this um, and as he should, I think, as a mixed martial arts fight and, and bring in all different aspects of his game. I think, you know, I think the win might come a little bit easier for Ian Gary in that case. What are your quick thoughts? Yeah, I actually hope this one doesn't turn into a kickboxing fight because I feel like that has a potential to be a little bit. I don't want to, for lack of a better term, I don't want to end up being tippy tappy and uh, mm-hmm. shot for shot and kind of goes the distance and similar to what Andy said with the Darren Till, Stephen Wonder uh, type of fight. Uh, I'd like things to be mixed up quite a bit, get different looks from both of them and see how they and uh, see how they fare, especially and I'd love to see them engage quite a bit because it's very easy for them to stay. They're both rangy strikers. It's very easy to stay on the outside and try and pick your shot and move. So um yeah, I, I I'm very interested to see how Ian approaches this, especially with that awkward uh, is it uh, London shoot fighter style that MVP has, how he can manage to break that range and get his shots off without getting hit in the way of. But uh Overall, look, incredible fight to to be added to the card. Um, I'm going to have one quick one. I'm not going to take too long on this. But there's a, a little dilemma that's appeared in my head ever since, and I'm not trying to shit stir here. But if, um, I think Leon Edwards has previously referenced that if Conor beats Chandler, there's an opportunity he could be run, that he could get a chance at the welterweight title. If Ian Gary wins here, he's also in that position. He's also going to be in a position where he could fight for welterweight title. Is there a point at some time down the line that we could actually, if worlds collide, 
could those two end, could McGregor and Ian Gary actually end up meeting? Is that even a possibility, I wonder? But um, it's crossed my mind there recently. Is that- I mean, I, I was trying to suggest recently enough about Andy uh, is salivating uh, now here. He's when salivating we were talking about Colby as the, the opponent and if someone pulls out, like, yeah. stranger things have happened. I, uh, I, yeah, I don't think, I, I genuinely don't think that ever happens. I don't think that's something that Ian would want. Um, and there's a lot of moving parts there too. You need a lot of uh, things to go your way. Obviously, you need the chance for McGregor to, yeah, he has to beat Mike Chandler first, obviously. Potential fight with Leon then. We'd have to see how that goes. So, um, I'm just going to try and throw this out there. M- Michael Chandler gets injured, trips over a wire in a production set the day before the fight. What happens? They'd probably be throw MVP in there with McGregor before they throw Ian Gary. Imagine that. You'd be sick if you're Ian. Yeah, you would. Yeah. You would. Yeah, MVP's be, paradigm, be... isn't he? That's right, yeah. So that's never going to happen either. So, uh, yeah, interesting times. But I don't think I don't think that Connor nor Ian wanted. I don't think that the UFC will be wanting to do that. I think they want to try and build Ian off the back of Connor, but you never know. Stranger things have happened. Stranger things have happened. Uh, we'll break down that fight obviously a little bit closer to the time. You have to give a shout out also. Uh, trio of fights officially official for the UFC 304 card in Manchester. Sam Patterson versus Kiefer Crosby announced uh, late last week. That's a belter in the 170-pound division. Sam Patterson uh, moving up a little bit there to take on Kiefer. Obviously, we have uh, Kaelin Lochran versus Ramon Tavares at 135. And Shauna Bannon will take on Ravina Oliveira as well, um, which is marked down as a 135-pound fight on Topology, but that's definitely not 135. It'll be at 115. It'll be the first time Ravina Oliveira steps down to 115 there as well. So, you know, great additions to the card there, Andy. Um, A lot of Irish interest as well. And as I said, a kind of, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the Ultimate Fighter starting soon. That'll kind of wrap us up. Busy old period at the highest level for Irish MMA as well, isn't it? It really is like this. The next couple of months for Irish MMA are, are wild. You've got obviously it'll kick off with the big press conference a day later, tough airs. Then you go into PFL or, or Bellator, Bellator Dublin, where you've got Paul Hughes's debut. And then, you know, only a few weeks later, we've got the 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 trio of Irish in, in Manchester. And, you know, talked about this with Pete in the crack as well. Like the, the timing of this, you know, you have a lot of Irish groups together uh, and not just like competing, but then you also have you know, the guys who are, are fully in the UFC, but then you've got Paddy McCarry and Omar Shaban, who who knows what's going to happen there in the Ultimate Fighter. Who knows, you know, whether they'll win, whether they'll lose, whether they'll get an opportunity on on the finale card and, and get their entry into the UFC. So it's really, really exciting. And yeah, we've, I know it's not a, a fight card, but we have the UFC back in Ireland in just a week. So... God, you, guys, wanna, you, yeah. you lads, I'm going to put it to you lads here now. I'll not, be, I'll not be there. I've tried my best anytime that I've got to speak to Dana White uh, to mention the, the, the thoughts. There's no going to be no better saying to go there and ask him and absolutely riddle him about an Irish show and see when. It, and I think, I think he'll come back. I think he'll feel the energy. I think he'll get a reminder. And if enough questions come and if there's enough of a push on it, I think that, you know, this press conference could lead us towards an Irish event. Not this year, I wouldn't say. Maybe next year. So the 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 ball is in your lads' court now if you're going to be there asking questions. Put the pressure on them. Put the pressure on. We need that Irish show so badly. It would be unbelievable to be able to experience it again. Um, to round it all off, Quilcha tough starting up, like Andy mentioned. Uh, Omran Shaban. Paddy McCurry uh, will be in the tough household, kicks off on uh, the day after the Irish press conference. Um, and might we say tickets will go on sale May 29th. This podcast will probably be out by the time yet. Sure, it will. It'll be out the it, morning. So if you're listening early, it's at 10 a.m. If you're listening in the morning, if you're listening in the evening, go. they're probably already gone. Go get them now. Go listen. Just go get your tickets. Ticketmaster.ie. There they're you free. go. 100%. You excited for tough? Does it add a little bit of ed- extra intrigue to you, Quilcher, with the two boys competing on it? I know it definitely does for me. I wouldn't be watching it if it wasn't for the two boys, to be honest with you. Um, I kind of fell out of tough for years. I think I can't remember the last one. The last one was uh, that I really watched before the 
McGregor season just gone was the one with uh, where Ayrton was on. So years and years ago, tough, can't remember what number it was. But uh, yeah, look, I've fallen out of it. So the only reason I'll be watching is the two lads. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to see how they go. It's, that, it just adds a bit of excitement. And uh, yeah, exciting times. Not too not too far away now. No spoilers, thankfully, have come out. So that's happened in previous seasons. And I hope it stays that way. No spoilers. No fucking spoilers, Andy Stevenson. That's, uh, that's all I'm worried about. <laughs> I don't know. Right? Right? Because I know he has his finger on the pulse. I know that he's looked sufficient for information. I was like, I want to I want to go in radio silent in. And enjoy it, uh, enjoy that live action as well. Um, look, we talked about what's happening in Irish mixed martial arts. Obviously, we have a Bellator show that's coming up um, at the end of July, July 22nd. We're going to head on over here and we're going to talk to Nate the Great Kelly. Obviously, there's been a lot of chit chat about his matchup with Paul Nolan on the event. Uh, and another kind of uh, chit chat in general about his development of his career and stuff like that. So we'll send it over to Andy and we'll listen to what Nate the Great Kelly has to say about his fight with Paul Nolan right now. In a week where we are prepping for the UFC's return to Ireland for the Conor McGregor and Michael Chandler press conference, who better to have on the L Triangle than some say the star of the show last time out? And Nate the Great Kelly. Nate, thanks for joining us today on the L Triangle. Thanks for having me on, lads. I appreciate it. How, how much... Uh, I realise that like every single interview you probably ever do is always focused on, on the, uh, the press conference, but how much do you remember of that press conference? No, I don't remember any of it. Um, yeah. I, have a, I have a bad old memory. I don't even remember what I had for breakfast. So that was like playing... I don't even know how many years ago now, 2015. So nine years ago. Um, I don't, I don't remember any of it. I remember kind of, I remember bits of it after and stuff like that and thing, but not much of it. Like I don't, don't have much of a memory. Uh, if I still, still had the long hair, I might throw up in the man bun and hop on the mic for the next one. And that might, that might do a few numbers. I think so. See what happens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I'd say it is a bit mad though, like because you obviously you're very young when that took place. Like it's, it's almost ten years on now. Um, I'd mm. say it's a bit weird to this video of yourself as a child to be constantly kind of shown on screen and putting promos and obviously like i know you use it yourself uh, you know to your advantage as well but like yeah. i'd say it is a bit mad like looking back when you're like right this is me as a child and i don't really remember this at all yeah no it is weird it feels like a different life i'm like i mean i feel obviously i'm playing nearly 20 years of age now so i feel like a different person i basically am a completely different person so like looking back on it it's like I got away with it for a few years and then as soon as the sun the PFL it started blowing up everywhere again. I was like, oh looks like but um no, it's uh, as, as you said, I use it myself, like you need to like understand that this thing is like people people are interested in seeing and seeing how far it came and it kinda of blows up anywhere when I post or whoever posts it. So um yeah, you need to use it to your advantage and I'm happy that I jumped up on that mic a few years ago because it it works for a good promo reel anyway, so yeah, did it get to a point where, at a certain point, you know, obviously before the PFL signing, etc., where you were kind of sick of it a bit, or like, were you kind of sick of seeing it? Uh, when you're a kid, you're kind of like, you know, you're showing, you're like, oh, I don't want to see it, but now, now I can give a rat's like, I'm happy that, um, I'm happy that it goes anywhere. The more numbers that I get in the videos, and the more clicks I get, I enjoy it. So it gets people talking, and it gets people interested in the fights, and that's what's most important to me now. So now I look, now I look back on it, and. I have a good positive reflection of it, but maybe when I was a kid, I was a bit like, ah, lads, leave me alone a bit here. I'm only living 11 years of age and I'm all over the place. But now, now I'm very happy, very grateful that I've done it. So. Well, it certainly does get people talking. Um, you've got a fight coming up against Paul Nolan on the 22nd uh, of June at Bellator Champion Series in Dublin's Three Arena. We did a podcast last week, and I know, or two weeks ago, uh, our last episode, and I know you listened to it because uh, you sent me a message saying, you know, good, good episode, but... Obviously, the first kind of 20-minute segment was all about you. Uh, it was us chatting about you and, and the reaction uh, and all that. Like, is How has it been, I guess, for you having this spotlight on, on your career and, and on you at such a, an early stage in your, your MMA career? Andy, you should know best now. Anything Nate the Great does, it gets people talking, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're well aware of that now. So, um, no, I, I love it. I love it. Um, as I said... Like I'm a fighter, and a part of fighting is getting in a cage and fighting someone, and the rest is selling people and getting people to want to watch your fight. So, um, although people talk and everything else, and we see all the rest, I bet you any money that every single one of them will be tuning into the fight. So, that's all that really matters at the end of the day. 
Alan winning the fights too, so best of both worlds. Yeah, look, you've had you've had two very dominant uh, displays in the cage so far under the the PF. What do we say with the PFL tour banner, uh, the two promotions. Um, when your fight well, obviously broke the news of of your fight in Paul Nolan, there was a big reaction to it. Were you anticipating a reaction like that? Of course, yeah. I can't do anything. I've played in some of the posts, made the great went to the shops in the hall of the Irish MMA scene and be saying, oh, that fly away in Ireland went to the shops better yesterday. And I'm like, oh, lads, we leave it out here. Um, but no, yeah, of course, of course I was expecting a reaction. You know, you're doing, for a while there, nobody was talking about me and I was getting a bit worried. So, you know, you're doing something right when uh, people are talking about you. I love it. What do you make of, like, it seems that, look, the reaction that we, we obviously were talking about last week, I'm sure... You've probably heard some of what we were saying anyway, but like the reaction this time seemed to be focusing in on the opponent. Like, I, I, look, I, I think we've said it to you before. Like, the last two opponents that you went in there, I thought that you were levels above. Like, it, it they do turn into kind of mismatches because you, you know, you go in there and you show I'm a level above and you get them out of there fairly quickly. To me, Paul Nolan is a step up in competition, uh, compared to the last two, but there still seems to be like a real focus in on oh, you know, he's not fighting the best guys in Ireland, etc. Um, what what's your reaction to that? Um, I'm sure you 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 guys know how it works with these promotions, but um, when they offer you to somebody to fight, you say yes, and then you fight the person. That's all that I've done. I've got names across. I've said yes to every person, and I've went in there and I fought them and I beat them. Exact same this time around. Got a name put in front of me. Said yes, and I'm going in there and I'm fighting them. If that name was any other human being. Uh, any weight class, whatever it is, I've been competing since I'm five years of age in competition style formats and I've competed against all these guys that people are talking about. And if um, if anybody was afraid to fight anybody, I, I never would have fought these guys before. So I know these these guys that are talking don't understand how these big promotions work, but I don't get to handpick me fights. I get names given to me, I say yes, and I go in there and I fight. That's the way I've always done it. I've never backed down from fighting. i been competing since I'm five years of age, and that'll never change. Whoever the PFL or Bellator put across me, I'll fight them. And that's as simple as that. Like that's So, so the narrative is, is kind of a weird one. Like I'm the one that's going out there and saying, no, I want to fight this guy, I want to fight that guy. Like To be honest, I don't really know about most guys in Ireland, amateur, pro, whatever. I just kind of focus on me. Only guys that I really know about are, are the guys that I train with, so... Whoever I get sent across to me, I'll say yes and I'll fight them. That's that. What are the conversations that you're like when PFL or, or yes, yeah, was, was it the whole PFL Bellator? I keep stumbling over words because they just, it's very annoyingly confusing that they don't just go with one brand at this point. But when they were having the conversations with you initially about getting you on, have they laid out like a path or, or a plan for you, like a developmental plan, or, or, or how does it work? Yes, yeah, so I'm on a developmental contract. So that just means that I'll be fighting with uh, the PFL. So I'm signed to the PFL before the two companies are merged. Like my contract. I think everybody now is under contract with the PFL. And anyways, I'm not too sure. But um, I know that I'm under contract with the PFL. So I'll be fighting amateur with the guys until um, I decide to make the jump to pro. And then when I do decide to make that jump, then it will also be with um, the PFL. So there's no like set timeline or no set anything. It's just kind of like you'll fight with us as an amateur. And then when you and your coaches seeing fit are you seeing when it's time to make the jump then you'll make the jump and then you'll also fight with us like uh, Biagio Ali Walsh the same yeah so yeah I was going to I was going to come in and say that like this is a model yeah. that PFL have been using for quite some time with, with Biagio yeah. Ali Walsh and a few more that are coming up as well so um, yeah it's not unique it's not it wasn't created just for your benefit it's something that they have used in different areas of the world when they're promoting the uh, amateur fighters on the way up yeah and then Nate like w- when it comes to development like we often talk about like amateur e- everyone knows amateur is for developing as a fighter the records don't mean anything really like I would look at someone like Kieran Clark one of your teammates as a perfect example of this where obviously he had a, he had a very long amateur career but his record, like it wasn't unblemished. It wasn't like, oh, he's gone out here and gotten a 25 fight win streak or anything like this. He's had his wins, he's had his losses, but he's got loads of experience. And then he takes that into the professional ranks and he's gone on an absolute tear ever since. When you're looking at the rest of your amateur career, and I know you mentioned, maybe, uh, I got the vibe, I think, in the, uh, one of the press conferences that we did after, I think it was your first fight, that you were saying, you know, you mightn't be 
at amateur for a very long time but like how do you want to develop as a fighter within your amateur career because what i would hope i'm just going to throw this out there i i hope that bellator and pfl aren't going to try and just be like you know ideally you go undefeated the rest of your run with them but not just in a way that's like right we have to maintain this lad's record at all costs and forget about him developing as a fighter and you know the long term what, what way are you looking at your the rest of your amateur career for me, as I said, I just want to fight. Um, it doesn't matter who it is, where it is, when it is, any of that doesn't matter to me. I just want to fight. Um, the opponents, just they, they just don't matter to me. As I said, it's amateur. But even if it was pro, whatever it is, I'm a fighter. I've always fought. Um, outside of all this stuff about the press conference, I'm one of the most decorated amateur kickboxers in Ireland. I've been competing in grappling since a young age. And when you go into these competitions, you're competing against guys from all over the world are at the highest level. So I didn't wake up one day and decide, like, oh, no, I'm not a competitor anymore. I don't want to fight anybody. No, I just want to fight. And when I'm going to go pro, when I'm going to make the jump, I don't know. As I've mentioned, I have so much competition experience. But um, it's, it's mainly, like, I just, I just leave my career into the hands of John and Dave. Like, uh, there's not, nobody else that can really um, guide me along and tell me when I'm ready for certain fights or jumps or whatever and the guys approve of um, everything that I do so whenever they whatever, whatever the guys decide or put forward to me uh, John or Dave I'll, I'll be 100% confident in what they say and I'll be um, I'll be ready to go yeah yeah I mean we were actually cage side for I think it was your very first amateur fight at the Nationals uh, when mm-hmm. you went in against Shea Cleland like I thought that was a very I thought it was a very entertaining fight a very competitive fight obviously uh, Shea took, took the win that day but like that's where, like, I don't fully get the whole narrative of, like, oh, you know, I understand, like, you know, the last two opponents, but, like, I don't get the, the necessarily the narrative of, oh, he's he's ducking people when your very first fight you went in there against a guy who had more, um, like, I know you have a lot of, you have years and years of combat experience, but it was your first MMA fight, your full rules fight, uh, and, and similarly, mm. you know, Shane had a, a number of fights. That being said... Does it like does it piss you off when you you see this? Because I know I know you're saying you know I don't know who these guys are, but like you know who Shake you know who Shake Leland is. I imagine you do know some of the FIA lads. Is there a part of you that wants to shut them up and be like, right, well, you know, I'll just go in and beat you? Like, do you do you want to kind of shut these lads up? None of their names ring a bell, Andy. No, my mission. Um, <laughs> no, I don't, look, I'm not even gonna give it the time of the day to, me, to mention these guys. Um, to me. Like it's the most stupidest thing in the entire world. This whole narrative, and it's not even really the guys themselves. It's people from their gym, or nobody's hopping on the comments and talking for them. So I don't know what's up with the lads. To be honest, Shay, Shay is quite cool. He hasn't said that. And, and if if anybody was to ask me, he's a great fighter. Respect him a lot. I got in there. I fought him. I didn't have to. I could have taken home a gold medal at the nationals that day because Henry got cut in his fight with Shay. I was in the final. I could have just walked home, took the gold medal because I'm so afraid to fight everybody. But now I hopped in, I fought him, absolutely no butter. That was on a day's notice. And look look at that, look at the division that was for the Nationals. I had to willingly sign up to fight these guys. It was all these guys that are talking about, oh, he's afraid. It's a stupid narrative. I signed up in the Nationals last year to fight. I, think, I don't even know who's in the division, but a lot of guys that are talking rubbish. So. And... I know you men- mentioned a few other guys from a certain gym. I fought both of them guys before. Plenty of history with that. With that, what I, I don't know his name. Um, it's, it, it, I'll, I'll try to think of it. But I, I, I'll of say history. the names. You, you don't want to say the name. I'll say the name. Day, you've got Damien McGuigan, you've got Omas Oliver, and you've got Kieran Coogan, would be the three prominent flyweights in, in FAI. So, you, who, which ones did you fight? Was that in kickboxing or what? I fought Damien multiple times in kickboxing. Multiple times. Not many okay. people know this, but multiple times I fought in kickboxing. So uh, uh, that's where I find the funny. I just I just sit back, let him run his mouth, let him do his thing. But yeah, you, you, you've, you've, you've you've thrown us a serious bone here because now my look. I don't know if you know, but I, I, I do enjoy a bit of Irish and Irish violence. <laughs> <laughs> and he's getting ready to stir the pot here. We won't we won't get we won't get into his his kickboxing credentials, but um. Yeah, they, 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 that's, I, I don't, I don't want to bring it up because it's, it's such stupidity, such stupidity. I fought both guys, so why would I not fight you again? I fight you, I drop it with absolutely no butter. If their name gets brought up, they say I'm fighting this guy, PFL, Bellator, 
absolutely no bother. Eight weeks, six weeks, four weeks, whatever it is, I'm there. I'm fighting it. So simple as. I mean, like, like all kind of like tr- trying to stir anything up aside. I think that would be br- like a fight at the amateur level where you've got two Irish lads who are on the rise, where in the long term, it's not going to go, you know, wh- whoever comes out of that losing, it's not going to go against anyone in the long term because it's, it's at the amateur level. And you've, you've got a fight that could be really built up. Obviously, Damien just beat uh, Shay there again at the weekend uh, up, at a, up at Cage Conflict. So I, I think against whether it's Damien, whether it's Owen, whether it's, whether it's any of the flyweights in Ireland, any of those the prominent ones, I think that's a brilliant thing for, for you, for them, for Irish MMA, uh, while also it's still at the amateur level where it doesn't really not that it doesn't matter but like it's not it's not like it derails someone's career or anything like this would you agree? Let's be honest we all know the reason that it'd be a big fight not because of any, any of the guys that are mentioned if this, this is why everybody is talking every single person in Irish MMA even guys that have no relation to, the, to, to even even in a million worlds would they be able to fight me they want to comment they want a name there, and it's this is the way it works. But as I said, if people aren't talking about you, not doing something right. But I'd be the only reason that um, it'd be a huge fight. Like these these guys are fighting week in week out, and let's be honest, like nobody really cares. Nobody outside of Ireland cares in any ways. Like I'm, I feel like I'm so far ahead of these guys in so many aspects that it's um, I'd be giving them a huge opportunity if if their name gets put forward and I say yes to them. So, um, I think they just need to be a bit. A bit nicer the way they go about things. Um, I know Owen, Owen keeps begging, but he, if he was a bit nicer about it, maybe I'll, maybe I'll consider him. And uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. As I said, their name gets put forward. I fight them. Absolutely no bother. So. Well, look, you've you've got a fight uh, ahead of you on your hands anyway in two weeks' time at Paul Nolan. What do you see in Paul Nolan as a competitor? Uh, I think I think he's a good fighter. Um, he's obviously obviously a lot older than me. Um, but I just I just don't think that uh, he, he's on the same level as me and in in any in any aspect of MMA to be honest. Um, I think I think I'm gonna go through him uh, fairly handy. But he is he is a very good fighter. He's a step up in competition from the last two guys. But I think I'll go out there and show again that um, he's not on my level. In terms, how much? If I, sorry, you sorry, 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 Andy. I just wanted to kind of circle back on your development as a fighter because as you said you've had combat sports experience now since you were five years of age and and that would you know put you a lot ahead of a lot of other amateurs in the com- uh, country right now in terms of you know competition experience for you is coming abundant so far so i'm just curious what your mindset and what your approach is coming into these kind of fights uh, you know, given that you have a lot of other competition experience and everything, is there certain aspects of your game that you're trying to develop right now, um, right ahead before you go into the, your professional career, or, or what's your mindset coming in uh, right now, coming into these kind of fights? It's just improvement. Like uh, for me, I make all of my improvements in the gym and every single camp, and I think I'm showing it with with all my fights. Like if you look back on my first fight to the last fight. I'm making um, huge leaps and jumps and everything inside the gym, outside the gym, everything that I'm doing, I'm treating, I'm treating every fight like it's a professional fight. I know people say like amateur doesn't matter, it's the record doesn't matter, whatever it is, but uh, I'm a winner, so I want to win. And uh, that's all that matters to me is getting in there, getting my hand raised. So I do everything in my power during the training camp, in the gym, outside the gym to make that happen. And um, yeah, my, my development is going to happen inside the gym and then it'll show in the performances. And as you said, I have a lot of competition experience. I don't know when I'll make the make the jump to pro. Um, I don't plan around. Um, my my plan, anyways, I would probably be pro already a year ago if we can make the uh, <laughs> make the choice. But uh, that's up to John and Dave. But uh, I think I think after the next one or next two, I'll I'll sit down and have a good conversation with both guys and just see where we're at. But yeah, I don't I don't plan around on uh, sticking with amateur too much longer. I've been in this too long to to, be not, to not be getting paid good money, so I want to... Definitely wanna paid your job. dues, that's for sure. You definitely have. Like, and I, I understand what you're saying about in-gym, but you also have to kind of take into an aspect that in-cage experience as well, that kind of live action as well. And 
you know, it can be said, obviously, you know, you want to go in there, you want to finish fights, but there can be a lot to be said going in there against those tough tests, getting a good 15 minutes or whatever it is, three, three minute rounds, a good nine minutes as an amateur under your belt as well. Is that something that you think about? Yeah, yeah, I know. Like, I, don't, I think competition experience with me is kind of like, it, it's something that I'm so used to, like, you know what I mean? I'm it was my first ever, that was my first ever time fighting on a show was in December in the tree arena. I hadn't walked out. My last walk I was like, I don't know, and played some basketball in kickboxing. I'd never fought on an MMA show mm. before fighting um, in the tr- in the tree arena in December. So I think competition experience, like in that case, I don't think I need much of it. I feel like I'm, ver- I'm fairly seasoned. Like I can make them walks and make them steps inside the cage and I don't feel the pressure. I don't feel like anything under those lights, I can just go out there and perform and I've showed that um, opponent aside, anything else aside, you can only fight who's in front of you and you can only perform to the best that you can and I showed that I am able to do that in them big settings. On my first ever time competing on a on a MMA show, it was in the three arena on, on a PFL card, so um, yeah, I think obviously the level of competition will stand to you um, but as I said, if these fights happen, they, they happen or not, here, um, I'm not here saying oh they won't happen or I don't want them to happen or anything like that. The way, as you know, the way these shows work, they come to people, they come to me and they say, do you want this guy? I say yes, and if it happens to be any of the guys, then it'll be a yes, and I'll, I'll be fighting them. Like it's, it's, it's nothing on my side. So. I know you have all this experience from like competition, growing up from competing at age five, and like you're competing in these big shows. Is there ever a worry, especially with your development, that uh? of just competing maybe two or three times a year because Bellator or PFL, whatever you want to call them, are like they only come to Ireland once or twice. Um, is there ever concern about just fight once or twice a year? Or like do you want to actually compete more as well in other shows? Um I am happy I'm happy competing with the with the PFL and Bellator to be fair. Um but no look I, I, I still in for four for like this fight. I had a fight in March, June and then I want to get another two or three in. So that's um like I want to get five or six fights in this year, and I'm well well on way to get that done. I know they have a show in London in September, and then um there's a show somewhere else, PFL Europe have a show in September as well. So I'll be straight onto that one in September, straight back into camp, and then look for something else. Then at the end of the year, and um, maybe look at the one IMFs as well. I know the world's at the end of the year, so I'll uh, I'll see where I'm standing on that as well. But I'm definitely gonna get in at least five or six fights this year, um, and that's. That's a that's a pretty busy year, so definitely. Maybe. And like what, what I meant by the shows is obviously competing abroad on the other PFL shows, because uh, obviously right now you seem to be exclusively competing in Ireland. Is there like has there been those talks about going to the likes of a London? I know they're in Saudi Arabia recently, where they flew over one that from the UK. Or have those are those in the pipeline mm-hmm. for you? Like? Yeah, I think one hundred percent. I think the way that the Irish shows have kind of lined up, it's worked perfectly. Like uh, it was December, March, and now June. And um, I don't know if they'll be back then till the end of this year. So uh, a lot of guys want me to fly, want to keep me active. And uh, they have another uh, flyway signed to them on an amateur developmental contract. He trains in England. They have a show in September in London. So I want to, uh, after this fight, I was going to call him out, but I'll do it here now. So I, I've already said it to Dan Hardy. I commented when he had his first fight. That, that's who I want next in uh, September in London. So I'm going to try to get that done uh, straight after this fight. I want a free holiday as well after lads. I'm sick of fighting in Ireland, so uh, America, <laughs> anywhere, wherever lads, Saudi Arabia, I'm ready to go. So um yeah, that that that'd be that'd be my ideal plan. Um get this fight done with now in four weeks, another good performance, hop on the mic after, call him out, take a trip to London and uh, yeah, that'll set me up nicely. Who who's the that fly with the that you're talking about there? Um the Afro Matt Malik, Malik is his first Malik, name, isn't it? Malik, Malik, oh, okay. yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Nate the Great doesn't take hard fights, but I'm calling this guy out, you know what I mean? So I was, <laughs> let, let, let's see what they say. Just to piss them off, I want to fight this guy. Smoke him and then we'll see what they say. So they'll still say something. They'll still say something. Nate, uh, we, uh, we referenced it there earlier on. The first time we saw you fight in a full MMA rules fight was in your own gym. It was in SVG Ireland. Now you're fighting in front of three arena cr- crowds regularly how much of that how much has that experience 
uh, helped you uh, as far as dealing with the big noise? Because I remember after your first fight with him, you kind of spoke about how you felt different and how it almost felt like an outer body experience and that someone was controlling you. Has that changed since, you know, from the, the first fight to the second fight? Are you getting used to it? Does it feel a bit more natural now? Uh, like, what are you learning, I guess, and, and what what experience is it giving you fighting on these big shows? Yeah, it's um, it's just, it's something else you can't really describe it. Like, as I said, I've competed so much and fought so much. and I didn't like competing in my own gym. I didn't have that feeling that I always do, like that nervous. I, it felt like I was literally going in for a spar. But, um, like, I, as, as I said, it felt like, somebody else control me but it's like in the best best way possible it's like something else takes over me and it's it's not really me out there and I'm not I am obviously fully aware of what's going on I'm in this I'm in the I'm in the cage and I'm but it's it, it's, it's hard to even explain into words it's literally like that's a higher me takes over and it's 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 a mad feeling but um it's something that I've always dreamed of and it's something that not that I've just dreamed of or thought would happen it's something that I've literally pictured in my mind since I'm a kid like I've always Imagine myself walking out in big arenas. Imagine myself in the positions that I'm in now, and that's why I think it, it feels so natural. Almost like even when um, I was fighting in December for the first time, like people are like, "Oh, this is nuts!" Amateur hours fighting, on. and for me, it was like I always knew this was gonna happen. I don't know why everybody's uh, so surprised about it, but yeah, like it's 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 so real, and I'm so grateful to be in the position that I'm in now, like to be fighting in big arenas with on such a big promotion and to have all the eyeballs on me that I do. It's I'm so grateful to be here, and I always imagined that I would be in this position. Now. Obviously, you're you're fighting on the Bellator show up here, but uh, will you be going to the press conference on uh, on Monday and reminding Dana? Is it will, will, will there be a, a repeat performance? No, nah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if I'll be there, so I'll, I'll probably be training at that time. If I wasn't in camp, I might have made an appearance and hopped up on the mic. But um, no, nah, I, I don't know if I'll be there. I'll be in Vegas. Though. I'll be at the fight, so. I'll be in Vegas at the free. That's that's fair enough. Um, look, the fight against Paul Nolan. How do you see it playing out? Um, I just I, I think another finish, another early finish. Um, there's so many more aspects of my game that I haven't really showed. Like in my opinion, I think the last two performances, from what I know, I do in the gym to the performances that I put on the cage. Of course, they're good performances. I got the win. I got the finish, but. I don't. I don't think I've even showed like um, a fraction of what I can do. So on this one, I want to just show more levels to my game and um, put my way early, early finish. Well, look, you've you've got a, an anaconda choke in your first one. You've got an armbar in your second one. I feel like you know there's another there's another choke called a tri an L triangle choke. You know, just an L triangle. An just L just triangle. saying. Now you actually hang on a second. You, you also you ditched the L triangle walkout last time. What was that? A, was that a shot at us or what's the story? No way, no way. Um, it was I was just picked picked that song, and then I was thinking okay. like, oh, oh yeah, I okay. Pick, I shouldn't shouldn't have picked this one for Belfast. Like I might play and cause a bit of a store or whatever. So then I changed it, and then obviously like when I walked out, I played that song, but I changed it to a Fifty Cent song. So I was even like, what's going on? So um, <laughs> but yeah, for for this one, I'm not going with the L triangle again. I'm switching up. I'm trying to find. I'm, I don't know. I'm trying to find the. Uh, Try to find one that one that suits me. So I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, Nate, really, really appreciate the time. Uh, thanks for for joining us today. All the best with uh, the rest of the camp. Uh, Nate, Nate, the great Kelly taking on Paul Nolan at Bellator Champion Series in Dublin on Saturday, the twenty second of June. A huge card with Paul Hughes making his uh, his, his uh, I was going to say his professional debut, his PFL, his Bellator debut with the promotion. Um, so a big one it's going to be a big one and I'm looking forward to it Nate appreciate the time and we'll, we'll have you on again soon chat to you later thanks for having me on lads no issue. cheers thanks, Nate thank you alright boys Cage Warriors 172 in Newcastle in the books we spoke with Leon Hill the last time uh, we were on here on the Owl Triangle gave a great interview um, said you know redeveloped focus uh, redeveloped meaning went out there and put it all on show against Tommy Hawthorne. I oh, have to say a phenomenal performance here because, you know, the pressure that he had would have had on him after obviously picking up that loss. Uh, you, you could tell the pressure that he's putting on himself in the interview, I feel, that he did with us the last time as well. And went out there and took on, you know, a good prospect in Tommy Hawthorne, like watching tape on him and seeing the level of wins that he was gotten. Tommy Hawthorne is no joke. And, you know, 
uh, slow start for Leon, I think, in the fight. It made me a little bit of nerves, but got settled in, I think, you know, in around the two-minute mark. Started getting his shots off, landed a big head kick. Um, you know, Hartland tried to push the action, uh, but Leon really kind of combated that well, uh, defended the takedown well. And I thought round one, the key for him and him winning round one was how excellently Quilcha that he fought on the outside. He fought so well behind his jab on the outside. Tommy Harton was trying to get in on the inside, use his boxing, and obviously get in maybe to close the distance and clinch. But Leanne didn't allow him to do that at all. His distance control, uh, the jab, shot selection, and uh, you know staying outside that range was something he did so excellently in round one. Would you agree? I would indeed. Uh, the way he kind of managed to keep his range and pick his shots, especially that jab throughout the first round, kind of forced your man Tommy Hawthorne to kind of close the distance and wear himself out because doing that, he was you know, he's hunting him down and it was we- he was wearing him down trying to cut that distance and try and get a few shots in. And then we saw the results of that in the second round when Hawthorne was really deteriorating. And uh, yeah, I think we go into the second round then after, but uh, yeah, look, the first round in that sense just kept his range amazingly and t- w- warmed down really, really well. 100%. I was going to go there as well, Andy, and I'm going to bring you in as well just to talk a little bit about round two because, look, we saw that technical side of things in round one and that was a necessity for Leon to be successful there. We saw the dog in round two, let's be real. We saw the dog in Leon Edwards. Um, felt, you know, and you know, sometimes it's, you'll notice it more inside the cage than what we were looking at. And I could imagine in those clinch exchanges with Leon where he was winning that battle, he probably felt a little bit of uh, strength fall away from Tommy Hawthorne. But it was his willingness to push the grind and set that pace. And I got to say, the willingness of, and the excellent corner worker, Chris Fields, to really push Leon into that kind of mentality in round two was what really got him the finish forced Tommy Hartorn into a kind of a, um, a lethargic takedown. Leon ended up in mount, soon after took the back, soon after locked in the rear naked choke. Really great stuff from Leon Edwards. And, you know, or Leon Edwards, Not I knew I was going to say that, Leon Hill. Um, <laughs> really great stuff from Leon Hill. I, I can't stress that enough because this is a win that's going to age very well because Tommy Hartorn is a top, top prospect. I completely agree. And uh, like, if you look at Tommy Hawthorne's just like going to his topology, you're not going to know a whole lot about him. But like, this is a guy who's competed for Wales at the Commonwealth Games, and it showed like it wasn't just a case like Leon was looking. I, I know we're talking about the second round, but in that first round, Leon was looking for his takedowns and he wasn't getting them. Like, Hawthorne was like, Nope, gonna deny this. And he would punish him each time. I remember early, he was ripping the hooks to the body. The next one, he was throwing the knee up the middle. So he was punishing Leon when he was going for the takedowns, which forced Leon to fight that that game on the outside and use his jab and use his kicks. And I think it was late in the first round he got hit with a shot where Le- there was kind of like a separation where Liam was standing up and, you know, the courtesy of you let the fighter stand up and Hawthorne threw this kick and it, it did not sit well with Leon. And I think that's when the flip switched in him to be like, all right, fuck this lad. I'm going to absolutely butcher him now. And he goes out there and in the second round, he lands some vicious elbows over the top. Um, and ultimately, I know Chris was shouting probably <laughs> what felt like two minutes. He's bollocks, Leon. He's bollocks. I don't know if he actually was bollocks at that point, but at a certain point he did. He waned. Well, you could and, see him fading. And that, yeah. that's why I want to give credit to From Chris the shots for his corner work there. Yeah, because you, you could, see a slight fade and you could see you could see Hawthorne getting a little bit kind of frustrated and disheartened a little bit you could kind of see it in his you saw the reaction drop the face yeah yeah drop. and 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 he's you know your body language tells you a lot there and Chris fucking picked up on that instantly and and was kind of urgently on on I just said it was great stuff brilliant stuff and a fantastic win for you any final thoughts Andy before we move on no, not really. Just to, yeah, I completely agree. I think it's it's a a very very it's a lot it's a much better win than it looks on paper. Um, is I guess the best way I can describe it. Big it, time. It'll it'll absolutely age well. And I think look at that leaves Leon still undefeated at lightweight too. So I mean, you could look back at the last defeat that he had against Ewan Davis, and you could think, oh yeah, maybe you know that might hold him back a little bit from making a title charge. But really, maybe the Cage Warriors brass are looking at that. You know, this guy is still undefeated at lightweight. Um, you know, I think one, maybe two fights 
for Leon before maybe Trim maybe trusting them towards that title shot. Um, would you think that's a little bit too soon? You think that's right on cue, Quilche, for for Leon and what we expect to see for maybe the rest of the year into next year? I think two fights, uh, probably one to like. Yeah, maybe two fights until a title because that's that division stacked. Like, you know, I think stacked, they, they still have Mason Jones as well. You know, you don't want to have give him one more fight and then throw him in with the likes of Mason Jones. Um, so uh, I think two and then just build that up and then your record's in a great spot as well. And uh, I think enough experience then to just go straight for the title. That that uh, James Power fight is back on the cards as well. Like they, they yeah. both had a loss and, and come back since then. So that could be a cracker. With all due respect to James Power, and look at he got a great win. He fought a, a fantastic fight, got dropped early and recovered and got back and won. If I was to base the two performances between Leon and James, I would be picking Leon based off that. And looking, it's, you know, things change and circumstances change, but you know, I think with James Power, he he he's tough, but he gets hit, and I think Leon is a bit more of a technician. That being said, I'd love to see it happening. I'd love to see it happening. Um, another thing that I love to see is O'Neill and O'Neill winning inside the cage, and that's exactly what Jordan O'Neill did against uh, Tiro de Surdy's first round KO body kick liver shot. Beautiful, beautiful shot. Um, uh, we didn't really get to see an awful lot here from from Jordan because he was just damn too good, to be honest. Really, wasn't he, Andy? Um, good takedown defense, you know. Um, Realized the dangers, kept a, a little bit on the outside too, and utilized these kicks. I, I, I was very impressed by Jordan O'Neill's boxing in previous fights. We didn't even get to see that in this fight. Excellently placed shot, got the finish in round one, moves to three and zero, and you know another major player for Irish mixed martial arts in the Cage Warriors middleweight division, in my opinion. Yeah, we've seen his boxing as you mentioned in on the, the more regional scene in the in the UK, and he, you know, as since turning pro, he's he's looked. Like he's got serious power, but really, it was one shot. Like it was, he had to defend the takedown early, but it was the very first, I would say, like significant strike that he landed. Uh, it put him away. So, it, it, you know, it, picture perfect uh, shot, uh, body shot, and what more can you say? It was, it was a clean night in the office for Jordan Neal, and an ideal way to start your Cage Warriors run. It absolutely, is Quilch, isn't it? And there's a couple of tests there for him as well. Obviously. We want to see it probably a little bit of a step up, but not too much of a step up for Jordan as well as he kind of gets comfortable. But, you know, I wouldn't want, I kind of want to call it a mismatch, but it was a mismatch because Jordan is so good. But like, it's a, it's the style of match that you do get upon entry into Cage Warriors. It was kind of the litmus test. Let's see where we're at. But Jordan passed everything with flying colours, didn't he? He did. I think it's what we, from an Irish perspective, stuff that we would have expected because we know how good he is. Um, and that was case that it was just getting him in there and seeing how he fared against Lad. Maybe I wouldn't say mismatch on paper looked relatively fair, but then we saw when he got in there, just that uh, he's a level above, and uh, he looks like one that's going to be a problem for that division, one that they can start building towards the likes, the likes of a title over the next few years. But look, long away a debut. Thank goodness we finally see. It seemed like it was never going to happen the way it was going on. I think what two cancellations. So uh, great to see him in there. That body kick. Jeez, the wind. It took the wind out of me all all over here, or all the way over here in Limerick. So uh, Jesus, yeah, unreal. Great finish. Yeah, great way to kick off the Cage Warriors uh, Newcastle card. No pun intended there. But let's get on to uh, no. Let's no. I should say pun absolutely intended there. Shout out John Denny. Um, they say that. Um, I know you did a 10k today, but Ian walked so Jordan could run. There you go. Like I said, the tre- the original O'Neill trendsetter right here. Yeah, but uh, I can tell you for sure that Jordan O'Neill is 10 to 20 to 30 times the fighter than I ever was. So call credit to him. I'm very I'm very excited for Jordan O'Neill's career. Um, also very excited to talk about the cage conflict card that just happened this past weekend. Um, big big main event: Damian McGuigan, Shea Cleland. Um, up there, their first fight was uh, up there for fight of the year, really on 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 uh, the domestic side of things in Irish mixed martial arts so far. Second fight lived up to that expectation as well. A close fight, a uh, fight that was scored um, for McGuigan. Um, he um, he got the win on two of the three judges' scorecards, twenty nine, twenty eight. Um, a little bit of controversy surrounding the result. Andy, maybe I'll go over to you first of all, just to give us a run through of the fight and your thoughts on it. 
Yeah, a, a cracking fight. Um, Jesus, anyone who saw their their first match matchup uh, would know what to expect coming in here. Um, a little bit of a different one in that I felt like Cleland was more so trying to implement his grappling in, in this one. Um, but look, I thought uh, for me scoring the card. I thought that round one was was McGuigan's. Um, I thought he landed the more impactful round two. I gave it to to Damien as well. And I'd say, and again, these are close rounds. But like, I think it was if I remember correctly, the first one. He ended up in Mount at the end, and it was really the the like it was a very nip and tuck. I was watching this, thinking, you know, because I'd heard I'd seen some posts about controversy or whatever about the scorecards, and I was like, right, let me go in and watch this. And I was watching the first round, and every, people who I'd spoke to said, no, it was a clear, like it was relatively clean that that McGuigan won. And I was watching the first round, and I was thinking, oh, like I kind of given this to Cleland here, like it was nip and tuck. But then the final, say minute or or thirty seconds of the fight. Damien took over uh, when it came to he, he got him down or uh, he got to, to the mount position and landed some some heavy shots there. Um, now the second round was similar, I would say another close round. Damien McGuigan, I gave it to, and then the third round, uh, I gave it to Cleland. But I saw some posts online after this, and I had some people getting on to me around um, the judging and that an FAI fighter was judging the the fight. So I reached out, and essentially what what seems to have happened was there was there was a different set of officials that were, I think, due to be lined up for this show, and they weren't. And what ended up happening was um, an FAI fighter was ended up having to kind of step in and, and judge some of the fights, which is not ideal. Um, now, that being said, I don't think it really had an impact on this fight because I think that the right guy won, um, in my opinion anyway. And I think a lot of people I've spoke to feel that way too. Now I can completely understand from, from Shay's perspective and from, from Torres's perspective, you know, you're going in here fighting an FAI guy and you've got a teammate who's judging like that's, it's just not ideal. Um, it's not an ideal scenario. I also spoke with Paul Brown after, and he was telling me, look, this kind of just happens in the Irish scene. Like he has judged team Rhino fights, a number of times and you try and avoid this when you're a judge in that situation you it it could actually be counterproductive to the fighter because i would imagine anyone who's going in to do that obviously it's a a big responsibility but you know you're going to know that that kind of criticism is going to come so you're going to be you're going i would like to think that you're going to be in a mindset that you know you're going to be almost maybe over critical to, well, the to, in to that point, Paul also like Paul was kind of helping. Obviously, he's he's on uh, comms, but he's you know he's helping out. To be like, okay, you know, if there's anything I can do to help here, he's a Swiss Army knife of Irish MMA. He does it. He does it all. Does it everything? The the FAI fighter actually scored a fight earlier on in the night against one of his teammates. So you know, I I don't I can understand you know pointing it out, but I actually don't think it had an impact here. Quilch, any uh, any kind of um, wonder or disagreement about the scorecards in your opinion? No, it's one of those that could have gone either way. To be honest, Shall I agree with Andy the way it was scored. I think it was, was the first or second that was very close. Um, but either way, um, very difficult for a judge in general. Without never mind the maybe the issue that's occur- that's kind of arisen afterwards. Um, yeah, no arguments from me. Very close fight, very exciting as always. Two boys put on a cracker, and uh, maybe I wouldn't be surprised if we see them fight again. To be very honest, Jim, put it all to bet, and I'd be buzzing if we do. Andy, anything else sticking out to you there on the cage conflict card? A couple of uh, good wins there for a few of the fighters there as well. Take us through some of the action. Yeah, there was. To be honest, there was, there was some great fights on this card, and and before I do, I just because uh, I was I was realized as I was talking about the McGuigan and Clellan fight, I was like, I'm I'm my mind is like going to mush right now. That first round, the reason why I gave it for McGuigan, it wasn't because a lot of strikes at the end. It was a botched takedown essentially from Cleland and there was a submission attempt and it was fairly tight and it looked like, you know, had it gone on, it, it could have been, uh, it could have been finished. But I just wanted to, to clarify that because yeah, don't want to put out uh, false information or whatever. But anyway, we move on. Blaine McGill put on an absolutely fantastic uh, display against uh, D- Dimitri uh, Pintele. Like McGill looks just, he looks like he's got serious power in his shots. Um, he, Dimitri was just coming out swinging, but I think that, that, uh, McGill, he just looks a, a lot more of a the more polished fighter. So he ended up taking a decision there. It was 29, 28, 29, 28, 30, 27 on the scorecards, but I was really, really impressed by him. Um, we had Aiden Barrow from Yoda MMA defeated Josh Hoey via second round submission. So he, he got a nice armbar win there. Uh, a brilliant fight. 
Xavier Rooney versus uh, Thomas Cargan of FAI. Xavier Rooney, I was watching this guy and like he looks like the most stoic man just out for a walk in the park. And he, he, he came out, Cargan landed some nice shots early, landed a head kick, but then Rooney just started implementing his grappling and got a huge slam takedown uh, off of it. He just seemed kind of completely unfazed by the shots that Cargan was throwing. Uh, and he, he got a, a big... Uh, so he landed the first a slam takedown, then he got a big back suplex. Uh, it was like watching something from WWF back in the the late nineties, uh, and he, he directly from that got the Darce, uh got the Darce choke from there. So I thought that was it was brilliant. And again, after the fight, he looked like he had just kind of gone for a stroll in the park. Now Cargan was putting it on him a bit, but like he just nothing seemed to phase this guy. So very impressed by that. Uh, Richard Crean defeated uh, Party Marty Morgan, which is. He, my, he's, he, my, Party Marty Morgan is my flavor of the month because my God, uh, also Joe McCoggan and, and uh, Reese McKee were comms basically just ripping the piss out of each other for the entire thing, but they were getting great crack out of it. So P- Party Marty Morgan walked out and I've, the place was on wheels. Like his his fans were going absolutely nuts. He he started uh, very well early, but Crean managed to implement his grappling and, and ultimately got the, the second round submission. But even afterwards, Party Marty's fans are just like, he, he's, he's after losing the fight and they're still in full voice going nuts. So um, I just want to see him compete again because his fans are crazy. Loves a nickname. Um, Louise Brady had a, a, a nice win, a dominant win over Mel McCafferty. Really used her grappling well in this one and and uh, it was 30-27 on, on all three judges' scorecards. Uh, I, thought, I thought it was a, an impressive performance and the, maybe the fight of the night, uh, I'd say the, the mcgill Pintley one was was an absolute cracker as well, but the heavyweight fight between Matthew Poor of FAI and Darren O'Neill uh, of Team Rhino Waterford was class. It was a one-round fight, a proper knockout, and Darren O'Neill from Team Rhino Waterford came out really, really strong here, landing some really solid shots, but it was Poor's amateur debut, and for someone who is debuting as an amateur, he looks very composed and calm when he's landing you know you have a heavyweight fighter landing bombs in you and he's he's eating them well or as well as can be and then he's coming back swinging and really the story of this fight for me was his shots just were landing with that little bit more pop a little bit more power and anytime he seemed to land on darren o'neill it, it was hurting him um and and ultimately he, he hurt him a couple of times and landed a big 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 shot uh, to score the ko in the end first round finish a fantastic performance um, another great fight julian renault defeated kevin kyo in a bit of a nail biter it was it was nip and tuck fight if you've asked me to score this i would need to go back and watch it probably three times um there was a 30 27 scorecard i saw for renault i didn't agree with that one now uh, i thought that the the way I had it at the time, I realized I just said I wouldn't score it. I had the first round for Kyo because I thought he was landing the cleaner shots. The second round it was a very, very close one. And the third one, again, was very, very close. So I'm not sure how I'd give either of those. But look, I can totally see Renault getting the win there. Get off the um, fucking fence, Andy. Get off yeah, the fence. Uh, no, I'm, I will stay on it. Um, Harry Thompson defeated Chris Jones. The decision there. Chris Jones, I think, again, uh, he looked really, really solid. Joe McCoggan was pointing this out on comms. Another guy making his his amateur debut and fighting at SBG Charlestown looks really really good. He looks like he comes from a strike a striking background. His his boxing was very very crisp, um, but Harry Thompson really kind of dug deep and as the fight were on, uh, managed to to really come into it here. I'm. Running out of steam here. Barry Lockheed also defeated Shake uh, Mack in another split decision. So there's a couple of split, split decisions in this card, but um, yeah, a good a good uh, run. Another- of Another solid card, another solid card yeah. from the cage conflict guys as well. So, you know, always good to see. Good to see a couple of heavyweights on the scene as well. Yeah. I know you mentioned, and that was a good fight as well uh, with Matthew Poor and Darren O'Neill. You know, you won't see that much heavyweight action um, on the domestic side of things. Well, it's nice to see a couple of up and comers there now as well. And uh, all credit to Cage Conflict as well, putting on another savage card, which leaves us to head on over to talk to the guy who fought and won in the main event, and that was Damian McGuigan. We're going to hear about what he has to say about that fight, potential future fights, and a couple of other things as well. So we'll send it over to Quilcha to get that interview done right now. Fresh off his way in that cage conflict, Damian McGuigan joins us on the Out Triangle this week. Damian, how are you getting on? Big day over in Or today? Um, yeah, I'm doing good. Um, it was a good day out. Um, good to see the team get a get a win today and defend his belt. We um we have we haven't been privy to seeing it yet. We've got to watch it after. 
Can you give us any highlights that we should be watching back for that from that one? Um, don't want to mention any names, but someone got put to sleep with a Vaughn flu choke, so that was um pretty rare in submission. Nice, we'll have to watch it back. But look, we'll get into it anyway. Um, before we get into all the fighting that you've been doing recently, all the talk, um, do you know, I've learned recently you have mad history in. Uh, in combat sports, not just MMA, but you're dating back to years upon years, early days. Can you bring us through, and for those who don't know, your kind of upbringing into martial arts and combat sports in general? Um, yeah, I think when I was sort of about three, um, my parents tried to get me over to Ardine. It's like a small week, um, kickboxing club in Belfast. and We were too young to start, so we came back when we were four, and he allowed us to start, and then from there, we sort of... I sort of trained there for a bit, and then I started competing, and I started winning. Like, when I first started, I was terrible. Like, to see how far I've came is unbelievable. But I got a few wins in the competitions, and I got offered up to, like, the World Championship team. And then from there, I sort of moved down to Derry to train for about five years. So, as a kid, I was traveling to Derry three to four times a week just to train kickboxing, travel in the world. And then after kickboxing, sort of, sort of died down and moved into boxing for about five years, so... I was on the high performance team in the boxing, and then after all, MMA was always like the end term, end term goal, so I made the move. When you're making that move, obviously, you know, you're competing at a high level in kickboxing, boxing, you're seeing these, you have to adjust quite a lot having to compete like that, oh. and your style must have to change. But when you're doing that from such a young age, and you're, ch- and you're changing up and having to compete every other weekend, does it make it a bit easier transitioning just having one sole focus in MMA? Don't get me wrong, when I first started MMA, it was, I didn't think I'd understand grappling. When I got my first loss, I was coming in where, sure, because I fought someone who I fought in kickboxing. I beat him in kickboxing. I was like, sure, I beat this dude in kickboxing. This is, this is a hard, this is an easy fight. And then in 20 seconds, I was took down and put into an armbar. And then from that day on, I, I knew I had to learn how to stop takedowns, how to defend takedowns and sort of, Mix in the style. We're not completely kickboxing, but more of like an MMA sort of base. And like, you know, when you're putting your back straight away, you're going to instantly have to you realize quickly that uh, things are going to have to change. It's no longer them kickboxing ranks, isn't it? <laughs> Big time. I was the first one I said to Adam, I was like, Jiu Jitsu is hard. <laughs> I was like, it looks so easy, but it's so hard. And was that, was that MMA? Did you, did you go straight into FAI or were you elsewhere beforehand? No, um, I was at SBG Belfast for um a year. So I was um, to... it was an alright yeah. gym, like, but I didn't really learn much, and they weren't giving me opportunities to go out and compete. They were like saying, but I was too young to go out and compete. And I was like, I think I was about 13, 14 at the time. But I was like, fuck, I fought over a thousand kickboxing fights. What, what do you mean I'm too young to compete? And then that's when I sort of made the move to FII, and the best decision I think I've made in my life. What's it like over in FA? Because obviously you're training now with some of the best flyweights in the country, probably one of the best gyms for flyweights in the country between oh, you know, well. <laughs> between yourself, Kieran Coogan, Jared Burns, see Kieran Mulholland, and I'm probably missing someone else in there as well. But like, it must be like, you know, a shark tank full of flyweights inside there. It, it is really good because like, you never get an off round because sometimes like you have like a hard round and you're like, right, I want to go with someone who I can sort of like get my breath back, but then you look around the room, you're like, there's no one here I can use. Like, they're all animals. Every round I have up there is like a hard round, and I feel like that stands by you. So when you're in the fight, like I felt like I had plenty of times in the training against Jared Burns, and he he hits really hard. <laughs> and like you can, you know, you can see those, you know, the rounds that you're putting in the mat when you get in the cage and. I, you know, we've seen it most re- in your most recent fight as well. You're, you know, you're brought to the wire in a very, very close fight with Shea, a second fight between the two. Look, there's a bit of a, I guess, uh, talk about the judging situation and that, but... Uh, Listen, you know I, completely, I completely understand the judging thing because I, I'd probably be the same, but at the same time, like, after watching the fight back, I don't think this... The first fight, I think, was really close. I, I could argue that should have been... I could have been a split decision, I do think it won, but the second fight, I feel like it was a clear... Two rounds of one. You could argue that I won three rounds. I don't think the second fight was that close. But I do see where it's coming from, the judging thing, but it happens. Does it, does it annoy you a little bit that even though you think you won, that or 
or you're convinced you won and you did win, that uh, it kind of gets a little bit marred with uh, people saying the fact that you had that, you know, someone one of your teammates judging in that fight. Listen, the way I look at it, I'm three and all against the guy. Like, don't get me wrong, he's very good. He's really high level. And um, like, stay to make fights. And if me and Shay fight 10 times, it's always going to be a good fight. I can argue it could be close. But I won the last three fights, two in MMA, one in kickboxing. So I'm not really fussed about it. And I'm happy with my performance. And I feel like I won. So people can talk all they want. The thing with Ireland is there's not many flyweights around and a lot of them are in FAI. So <laughs> there's a very high chance I could imagine you and Shay actually end up fighting again just to settle this once and for all and no drama this time, no split decisions maybe. What do you think? To be honest, I think it's, that's me done with it sort of because I fought him twice. I think the next time if I was to fight Shay, it'd be like in a professional reset. I feel like I feel like an amateur there's no point in us fighting again as much as like a lot of people love to see us fight again. Um, that's probably done now for the amateur. Very fair. And like, look, looking back on your amateur career so far, you've kind of taken the amateur scene by storm. Um, this activity level is next to unmatched, and, and the wins as well. But look, how have you found it so far in terms of how you developed in into the fire you are now? And like, what have been your standouts so far coming through the amateur ranks? It's the tough face because when I started my amateur career after I fought in England against some Mexican dude, after that, I struggled to get much. It took me, I didn't fight for eight months, I think it was, because I had like pull out after pull out after pull out. And then I managed to fight Jamie McAleese. And then I fought Kim McCartan. And then after that, I had pull out after pull out after pull out. And then Pat Ryan, we one day, he's like, listen, I don't want to have to put you in right now, but you're going to have to fight Jamie out of visit just to have a fight. So I was like, fuck, this is a big step up. Because when I first started my amateur career, he was like sort of, he was like one of the top flyweights. And I always knew it would be a tough test. So Pat said, listen, we're going to have to take the step up and level. And then we got that fight. And then I was talking to Stephen Murray, he had conflict. And he asked me, he's like, do you want a title fight on Akuma? And I was like, I love one. And that's when I announced us fighting Matthew. With that Matthew fight, um, that must be the highlight, clearly, with that finish in the end and uh, I saw a little clip actually I saw a few clips uh, that I think your your man put up on Instagram of you throwing spinning back kicks at the age of five and there's one of you hit, throwing one at 10 in the BBC studios or somewhere like that and you you throw that exact same strike just you know a few years on after that then and, and score KO was did that make it was that like your favorite strike is that something you really wanted to kind of land in, in a fight I feel like I definitely was burned a lot because I think I've thrown one spinning hook kick in every fight I've had. I don't think there's been a fight where I haven't thrown one, to be honest, apart from maybe my last fight with Shea. But as a kid, I used to get finishes all the time with spinning hook kicks. But seeing kickboxing, like, see if like, you can't yield someone with spinning hook kick, it wasn't a big deal because someone else did it two months up the way. So it wasn't really a big deal. But in the MMA, when you land something like that, it's like, it's like really good and it's a big deal. It's, Definitely one of the best moments of the career. What was the reaction like when you see that going all over Twitter and Instagram and people sharing it galore? Yeah. Because I, I saw it pop up and all sorts were coming across that clip. It was unreal because that exact shot, we were working out the back. Because we kind of knew he doesn't cut people off, he just follows you. So Adam was like, the first round, just keep circling around him. Touch his legs, touch his legs, and then sort of lead him into the, the heel kick. And then he walked into it. Exactly, it was uh, no, it was it was unbelievable. And uh, look, one other another point I want to touch on actually is uh, you're, you're you're a twin, I believe, aren't you? Oh, uh, me, yeah. We had just so, also fights. Yeah, was there a bit of a competitive kind of streak going on in the house growing up? The two the two of you competing? Oh, is there oh, still so that going much, on? So much, like it's not as bad now. We're, we're both mature, like. But I remember we used to box, and like she hit me too hard, and I got angry. I hit her too hard. She got angry, and every time we respond, we were trying to kill each other. And then after, we're both crying. After, I think at one point we were banned from spawning each other because we used to be like, "You tried to hit me hard," and we used to go at each other trying to kill each other. Your Tierney Lachlan was was terrible. telling us a uh, Tierney Lachlan was telling us a story where him and Kaylin were in the car driving to training or something, and I don't know. I can't remember the, the exact specifics, but I think. 
one of them, they got to a point basically where they're in an argument and all of a sudden, Caelan's driving the car as he's throwing a box <laughs> at Tiernan's head. I'd say uh, growing up with a sibling who's also a fighter is, uh, is quite interesting. It's really good, to be honest, obviously. We're always competitive, so like we used to argue about who was tighter when we were getting our sport massages done. That's how competitive we were. We used to be like, no, I was tighter. I'm more sore. Like, we were always, so we still are super competitive, even we're doing sprints. Like, she would do one more sprint just to say she did one more to me. Just so she has it over me to say she did one more, but no, race is really good. Is there kind of fighting and, and combat sports? Does it always exist in your in your family, Damien? Did your parents or any relatives kind of grow up competing? Um, a few of them, like mom, my dad, and my uncle, they were sort of like kickboxing. They got like their black belt and kickboxing, and then after that, they sort of like they turned like twenty and sort of just packed it all in and just went on their separate ways. But I feel like I just thought of it. I was like, I love doing this every day. I could make a life out of doing this, and this would be pretty good. You mentioned that you're in the high performance um, gym there, just kind of getting prepared. Would, would you been hoping to try and get and go for the Olympics at some stage? So, um, I don't do the boxing anymore. It's when I used to do the boxing, I was in the high performance team. I was sort of the reason I stopped boxing was you weren't allowed to do MMA and compete at like a high level of boxing at the same time. Because I almost got bad yeah. in the All Ireland's, and they tried to pull me out from my final because they found out I did MMA. And you're not allowed to do both. And then there was too much politics involved. And at that point, I was like, I'll just be done with boxing and just put my full focus on the MMA. I've heard of experiences of that where, you know, they have had the limitations, even, you know, not in high performance gyms as well. But for you, it was mixed martial arts. You fell in love with that sport from a very young age. It was a, a no-brainer for you what the road yeah. you were going to go down. Without a doubt. It was always kickboxing, but in my head, I was always watching Chuck Liddell as a kid. Like, I, was, I still have the DVD sat in my room, and then I was like, I'd love to do this one. This is class. This is, this is unreal. And then after I started, we're in the kickboxing, and then after kickboxing, the end goal was always get in the MMA. With, with him... Go ahead, I was going to say you're you're in a fine gym anyway. Like when you were coming up, obviously as an amateur, as a teen, the likes of Joe McCulligan and Reese McKee and Paul Hughes were you know cutting their teeth on the professional scene and ultimately going and, and winning a cage warriors titles. How beneficial is it for you, I guess, to have lads like that in the gym who have kind of paved the path for you? Um, I think it's unreal because it shows me that I'm in the right place because they go to the same training sessions as me. So what it tells me is if I just put the work in like I have been doing every day and keep showing up, then there's no doubt I can't reach these levels. So it is good because we all sort of look up to the likes of a lot of the professionals and we can see the, the path they're setting for us. And we're like, they're opening the doors for us young ones to come up and start taking over. And up in FII, we, we're building an army. There's a load of people on the come up and it's exciting times really is like you guys have fighters everywhere both at amateur and pro like we you know paul's making his debut and or his pfl debut yeah. there soon as well and like the gym's on the rise massively but for you you're you know you're very you've an extensive amateur career now it's fair to say and like this i think as i said before you like you've had to go in with jamie i visit very early on in your career you've had to face the toughest of the toughest like there's not many, is there money more left for you to fight around like are you gonna have to start looking abroad um I'm not sure, because um, before I fought Shea, I was struggling to sort of get matched again, and I couldn't really get fed, so I'm not sure who's left with me for Ireland and what the next plan is, but I'm just going to stay ready and stay active and um, talk it out with my coaches and see what they think is the right move. One thing we have to touch on is, obviously, I think we all have Instagram. We all see it. Uh, and poor Andy gets the tail end of it on his Instagram comes the whole time. But, Name uh, Andy. He's a, he's a troublemaker. Of <laughs> I love it. I love it. Bring it on. He loves the drama. <laughs> but uh, look, like everyone uh, is, whenever we see, uh, and like Nate Kelly, who we've had on earlier, um, get a fight on PFL or Bellator, whatever they're called nowadays, um, we, we see your name popped up the whole time. And... What, what, what's it like? You, you don't speak up that much about it. It seems to be a lot of other... What do you think about all this? Is that something that really bothers you or how do you see it? No. To be honest, like, 
don't get me wrong, I would love to be fighting on PFL and fighting, like, no disrespect to Calm Seaton, but come on, like, there's, like, getting a fight, like, a handy fight, and there's fighting Calm Seaton. I really like Calm Seaton, but I don't think that was very fair, but I just don't think there's any point in my plan because, listen, because he's at the McGregor press conference, he has, like, a load of followers, so, of course, he's going to get these opportunities because... As much as I love the game, it's not a very fair game, is it? Because I feel like there's a lot of, I'm not calling it not good, but I'm just saying there's a lot of other fighters I feel like would deserve a better opportunity. But I feel like Nate's a step back, sort of, because look at all the guys I've been fighting, and I feel like he'll be a step down. Obviously, I'll get to show my skills on a platform like PFL, and that'll be unbelievable. But I just don't think the fight will be happening, to be honest. If it doesn't happen, is there like is there is there a plan moving forward for how quickly you progress to pro? Because you see it really it happened really young recently with some lads in their like early twenties just jumping straight into the pro ranks. Yeah, because I'm only nineteen at the minute, so I have loads of time on my hand and I've already got I've an amateur fight, so I've plenty of amateur experience, so I'm in a situation where it's what do you kind of do? But listen, I'm just gonna sit down and what a let will talk on the coaches, but I think we're going to discuss more and see where we go from here. Is there any like fights in just... Ireland uh, left for you, Damien? Like, is, is Nate the only fight? I know you said that he, that he's it wouldn't necessarily make sense, but when we look at the top amateurs in the country, it's they're all the vast majority of them are, are in FAI and flyweight at the moment. It's it's like it's yourself. <laughs> yeah, and then and then obviously you fought Shay, and you know Nate's in a prominent spot on. Uh, on PFL, there's a few other lads. I think like Billy Sutherland, floating around as well. Um, is there any fights left for you in Ireland? Listen, I've um, if I got the opportunity to fight on the PFL in Bellator, like I'm not going to say no to that because it's a really good platform to showcase my skills. So I feel like that could be the only thing left. But maybe looking into the UK and see if there's any fights in the UK if it makes sense. But I'm going to let my coaches talk about it and then they're going to sit me down and basically we'll go from there. That, that's fair How enough. Nate, actually, you... go ahead, Ian, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. How long do you think you have left at amateur? Amateur, definitely. If it was to stay an amateur, this is most likely will be my last year at amateur because I don't want to turn into a career amateur. Like, I'm taking all the fights I'm taking are tough fights and I'm not getting paid for it, so... I don't want to take too much more amateur fights, but I want to make sure that I'm completely prepared for the pro game. 100%. Sorry, Andy, for cutting over you. Take it away, man. No, I was just going to ask. We, as Chris mentioned, we had Nate on, and he happened to mention that, he, like, to be, in fairness to him, he said he's open to these fights. Like He'll fight whoever's put in front of him. And he did mention that you two had faced each other previously in kickboxing, but he didn't go into any details. So like, do you, what, do you, what do you recall about those fights in kickboxing? I mean, the last start no beef for anything, but obviously we were both kids, sort of back when we fought him, like in kickboxing, and obviously he was a good kickboxer, I was a good kickboxer, there's a few photos would say as I won, but we fought, I think I fought him about four or five times when I'm in kickboxing, I don't recall loads, but it is definitely a fight out loving MMA, like I have no disrespect towards him, like it's, it's just, he's fighting on a platform, but I like to fight on, and if I got the opportunity to fight on it, then I'm going to take the fight. But I don't feel like PFL, it would make sense for that fight to happen because I feel like the one is slowly building them up in competition. Because mm-hmm. Paul Nolan, he is a, he's a step up from his last amateur fight, but Nate fought. So Paul Nolan is a step up, and to be honest, Paul Nolan's a tough enough fight for him. Like, so we'll see how that one plays out. When you envision your, your career moving forward, and you said you could be your last year at amateur, like, Obviously, you'd love the PFL opportunity from an amateur, which could potentially lead into something as professional. And that would, I imagine, be a very kind of good opportunity and good situation to end up in. But outside of that, obviously, you've got a lot of lads um, who've gone down the cage warriors. Like, look at Paddy McCurry, who's just gone into the Ultimate Fighter house or he's just come out of it. And the show's about to start. Paul went to cage warriors, now PFL. Uh, Joe McCoggan, as Andy referred to earlier, and they've all been you know, a lot of, they've gone on to do incredible things to procreate. Is Cage Warriors or PFL or is what's like do you know the type of route that you kind of look to go down? See, um <clears throat> I definitely feel my first couple of pro fights well would be on like the local scene. 
maybe on cage concept or like shows locally and off the right air. I feel like cage warriors could definitely be the main route because a lot of the people from my team they're all on cage warriors and it seems like a good promotion and I feel like it's a good way to sort of get the UFC. So I feel like UFC is always the end time goal. PFL would be nice if they're paying good money, but from I was four years old, UFC was always my goal. Um, I'm going to work towards that every day until I reach it. And uh, if I, with the gym, obviously, you know, you've got all these killers around you on a daily basis. Like, what what, to, what are the rounds you're getting in with the likes of? Do you get to have rounds with, uh, I know you're a bit smaller, do you get to have rounds with the likes of Paul Hughes and all the lads? Yeah, but, um, like, I'm not sparring him every day, but I've had some good rounds with Paul. Obviously, like, he does beat the fuck out of me, like, but <laughs> you do your best. So it is good to get rounds people like him because he would, beat you but then he'd also like sort of help you after like he's a really good training partner that way where like he'd let you work and he would sort of help you out like like I just feel like Paul's unstoppable because I've like spawned it's like has he like has he that's good and so that's what gives me confidence when I'm in the right place because I look at people like Paul how good Paul is how good everyone is it gives you that confidence where I have to be in the right place because there's people traveling from Dublin from Derry just to train in my gym and I live 10 minutes away so Pretty grateful for. Yeah, and you're look, you're you're gonna absorb all that, you know, all that ability from them and learn from them, and it's incredible what you're doing, what the guys up there are doing in FAI. Uh, one one quick thing I wanted to ask, uh, because it seems one thing I learned is, uh, it's from you. I saw it posted once is uh, you kind of uh, to make it this far seemed to be, I guess, a miracle nearly. How uh, you were quite were you quite ill as a, a, a as a young fellow when you were quite young, was it? Um, yeah, I was like. I think I had bad asthma, like when I was first born I was like fighting for my life sort of and then I think I had bad asthma, my lungs collapsed on me and that was sort of like the main reason why I started martial arts was I had to get into a sport. The doctor said I need to get into a sport to sort of like help build up my lungs and like get them a bit stronger and obviously my dad had kickboxing and he was like listen I want him to be able to defend himself so we're going to win the kickboxing. Like I, he didn't think we'd take it this far. Like, it started off from, like, a local kickboxing competition to compete in the world at kickboxing, and then it just took off from her. That's incredible. And, like, it's almost it's almost like something's meant to be, but would you say to an extent that, like, it's... Obviously, they said you, they asked me you needed to uh, you need to take a sport, but uh, it's, re- it's almost uh, not saved your life, but improved your life to a whole different way that you may not have realised like, before. Big time, like... Because I always feel about it, like after a fight, you're like, right, take a week off, and then you're going to take a day off, and then you're like, what What do I do? I'm bored here. I, like, I'm, you're just so used to training, where when you take a day off, you're like, fuck, I'm bored here. I have, I have nothing else to do. <laughs> so you go right in your train. Does that, that doesn't affect, that, is that all, that doesn't affect you anymore? Is it something that you managed to grow out of over time, and now you're just doing what you do? Just doing what I'm doing. I love training. I, I'm grateful when I get to wake up and I get to train and fight every day. I think it's a very good life to have. Damien, you've spoken a number of times in this interview about you didn't think you'd make it this far or you kind of can't believe that it's you've gotten this far. You're in a position now where, for my money, and I think the lads have probably agreed with me, you're the best flyweight at amateur in the country. How far do you think you can go in MMA? Honestly, the fact that I'm here right now, I, I didn't believe it. Because after my first MMA loss, Adam told me, um, Mercy, hi, good job, five years. You'll be a top amateur with a few titles. Um, I sat and thought about it, and he was 100% right. So I really feel like I can achieve anything I want to achieve. USC World Title, I really think it is possible. Because a lot of people, they probably listen to us and be like, fuck, I'm all right. There's no way I'm going to win a UFC World Title, but I know... With all the training I'm putting in, like, I will win a world title one day. And I don't care what age it takes me to get it, I will reach it. On that note, I think it's a great way to end. Damien, it's getting a bit late, so we probably kept you up a bit later than you wanted. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for joining. No worries. Uh, okay. Great to speak with you. Looking forward to seeing your the rest of your career and how it plays out. And sure, look, I'm sure we'll get you on eventually again. 100%. Thank you very much, lads. All right. Uh, speaking about domestic action that didn't take part, 
place in Ireland, Cage Legacy. So are we allowed to cover this card, lads? It technically happened in the UK. I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, Case Legacy, um, another successful show over in Liverpool. Um, Richie Smullen fought in the main event. Obviously, excellent performances from Keith Kyo uh, and a couple of others. Quilcher, you're going to take us through the best of the action, uh, starting from top to tail on the Cage Legacy card. What were your thoughts? Who were your standout performers on the night? Yeah, look, uh, their first venture over abroad and they went to Liverpool, put on a relatively decent card overall. Um, not uh, there's a lot of hype behind this, but before this anyway, by uh, by Declan Ken and, and Co. And I hope it it looked all right. Um, I'm not sure if there was many in the audience. The stream, the way the camera was positioned, I couldn't see, but it did look like it from pictures I saw afterwards. So uh, yeah, look, fair play to them. We got their first show abroad, big move. But uh, the card itself, yeah, some good fights there to speak about. Richie Spullen versus uh, Marcos Junior is probably the main one to be speaking about here because Richie's been on. Like, He's been on a bit of a tear recently competing in uh, Cage Legacy and he's really on that push to try and get back to the UFC and he did and you know he added another win, win to his record there and could continue that push now. There was uh, a lot of talk about the matchup as well, but Marcus Jr. kinda of gave him a lot to, to deal with in the early stages at the very least, well, didn't he? Yeah, your man's your man was tough that Marcus Jr. Like he was no rollover, like you know, some people might have expected to be he just roll over, but he kind of uh, they had a good few grappling exchanges, uh I think he had uh, he had Richie's back there one, uh, at one point in the at one point in the fight. He had a guillotine on him. Uh, it was first round was very good, a bit back and forth at times in the grappling. And then now, despite all that, I was still would have scored it to Richie. Your man Ju- Marcos Junior still looked like he was well in it going to the second. And then he even landed a shot early in the early in the second round. But uh, at, after that, Richie just took over, took him down. And then in the in the lead up to the finish, head up against Cage just. just firing shots and until the referee stepped in. Admittedly, I would have thought it could have gone on a little bit longer, but to be honest, it was probably just if you're just delaying the inevitable really by uh by stopping it then because there was no way your band was getting out of it. And uh, he was actually Marcus Jr. was kicking up a bit of a fuss then that Richie had his hand in the glove or something and from the angle I we could see in the stream. Don't, I couldn't see what he was on about to be honest. So uh yeah, either way, another good win. Um that uh, adds what three and three wins in three months, and uh, it's got to be a big know. show for next for Richie lads, isn't it? it has to he's got for a UFC now. Yeah, he's got to get like I mean, we're got, we're coming in around Dana White contender series. Maybe he might get a crack at that, but you know, fair play to him. He's getting the head down. He's competing in fights and he's winning fights and he's finishing fights. We all heard Mick Maynard and what he was saying. That's what they want to see. So fair play, Richie is kind of taking off all those boxes, isn't he? Yeah, like he. Really? Literally, like you, you talk to Danny McCormick, she'll tell you that they they want people who are finishing fights and on streaks and ideally undefeated. Now, you know Richie isn't isn't that, but he's he's got a wealth of experience. He's been in the UFC before. He's been on uh, on tough briefly, um, and it it changes how a fighter approaches things. I know people are probably going to be looking at some of these matchups, being like, you know, well, they're not the the highest caliber opponents that he's going in against. But if the UFC matchmakers are telling you we'll only look at you if you go in and have like five finishes in a row, but then that's going to change how someone approaches their career and they're going to prioritize, right? They're going to get as many fights as possible and as many finishes as possible. Um, So that that's that's what he's doing. And, you know, I can't fault him for that at all. So it, it'll be interesting to see if it works now. Um, But yeah, I, I would love to see Richie on a, on a big show somewhere. Uh, like he's he's too he's too good to be fighting on, you yeah. know, zero disrespect to, to, I don't mean this in a disrespect way to Cage Legacy, but like Richie should be fighting for the best promotions in the world. Like it's the PFLs, uh, the Bellators, the the, the UFCs, uh, etc. You know what I, I mean? I couldn't agree more. And you know what? I know that you didn't mean any disrespect to Cage Legacy, but f- fair play to Cage Legacy as well for being able to keep him active as well. I think that has to be Absolutely. said as well. Um, what we do have to say, Quilch, I'll go back to you, Kiko. Unbelievable. One thing that stuck out to me when we were chatting to Ki Kyo, he took on Christian Hibero. He said that, wait till you see my shot selection. He said, I can't wait to go in there so you'll see my shot selection. And his shot selection was savage in this fight. He absolutely butchered Ribeiro to get uh, that first round knockout win. He really did. And the one thing, it's like, uh, I think they described it in the commentary as a kid with like new toys because he was allowed to throw knees to the head for the very first time. That clinch work, and even I think there was a single, uh, single, uh, was a single arm hook or whatever it was. Um, he was landing knees 
so cleanly on him and they were he was butchering him and then when he had the two hands all over the head full clean she just started kneeling him in the head unbelievable and uh yeah I, I love that side of it it's something we never got to see from Keith before and he really unleashed a new version of him um had a lovely head kick in there at one point as well managed his range well got caught once but that's you know uh that's gonna happen um and then even you in the get, sequence you get, you get kept on us every now and again in the professional I, ranks so you do just, <laughs> Just a shot to wake him up, I think it was, you know. Yeah, but, 100%. Um, he took off, and then, and even in the finish, he threw a flying knee. Um, yeah. And then in the lead up to the finish, and then just, uh, yeah, that was all she wrote down, levels above. Uh, great, great debut now, to be fair to him. Really, really 100%. enjoyed it. Take us through quickly on uh, any of the rest of the Irish action on the car wheelchair. Yeah, look, go through the Norris uh, Bartoska fight uh, against Paolo Martins. That was actually a bit of a brawl, to be honest with you. And I think people could have looked at this and thought it would have been very one-sided and Aris could have gone in and just butchered him. Paolo Martins is a zombie. I would love, do you know what? I'd love to see that happen again because he marched forward. He hurt Norris. He gave him lots of problems. I thought there was a, at times that Norris was going to lose this fight. Uh, it went it went the distance. Uh, Norris took the win at the, in the end. His striking looked good. I think he did get a bit tired. It wasn't his best performance, to be honest. The two, the two of them did look tired. They left a lot, awful lot in there, but they were kind of struggling a little bit, which is understandable. That's it, yeah. They were, no, they were shattered by the end of it, and you could tell by the body language. Um, and you could tell how dangerous Martins was. At one point, we saw Norris run away from him, uh, like literally run away from him. But he, you know, he had to really dig deep in that one, and you could tell he landed some nice shots near the end, and he got a... Yeah, look, got the win. That's all that mattered. And he moves to what, 3 0, 4 0? 3 0 as a pro now. So uh, look forward to seeing what's happened to him. what happens with him next. Uh, Chris Stringer, he was also in the card. Commonly mistaken as a Liverpool man, but he's from up the north there now. Uh, you know, a long veteran in Irish MMA. He looked very slick. Strike was brilliant. He was like a sniper in there. And, uh, you know, brilliant. I think he wants on the next Cage Legacy show as well. So, uh, Great win for him. And then the last one was Reno Flaherty versus Yuri Sida, I think his name is. Uh, that was, to be honest, it was a complete mismatch. Uh, I didn't really learn much from it. Um, but look, Reen can only fight who was in front of him. And he'd got the double leg, took him down, straight into side control. Sida hung on to the neck, actually, and kind of risked being von Flude. Um, but then Reen passed him out, rained down shots, and that's all she wrote. I think it was only about 90 seconds overall. But, Beat the uh, shit out of them. Yeah, really did. <laughs> <laughs> that. <laughs> that's it all action at Cage Legacy Liverpool brings us to the next card the Red Cow uh, in the warehouse uh, July 27th for Cage Legacy 23 24 23 23 I think it is um, but anyway our fighting championships is on right now as we're recording this podcast if we're being honest so out of the interest of the card interest of the fighters we are just going to read out results and stuff like that we're not going to do that we're going to take the time we'll watch the card back and we'll cover that in a little bit more detail on the next episode of the Owl Triangle so just a little bit of a schedule clash there there's nothing too much we can do it so what we'll do our fighting championships that card uh, headlined by Michael Shields and Jed Paolo um, we will cover that on the next episode of the Owl Triangle so bear with us until then couple of tidbits lads to round us off a little bit of negative really uh, well some positive some negative I guess let's start with the positive three wins for Phantom MMA over at Warriors MMA in Poland Vladimir Stanka Dorian Kolechnikov and Mario Georgi all won by first round finishes so a very successful night for the Phantom lads over there as well um Aaron McDonald moved to one and one as a professional. He picked up a rear naked choke win over uh, Radislav Lackey at PML, which is, I was confused. He was wearing the Octagon shorts during that fight. And I was like, what? And he wasn't fighting an Octagon, but it's basically Octagon sister promotion. So, um, yes, yeah, cool that they're giving guys opportunity to fight outside of Octagon there, keep them active as well. Um, yeah, good dominant performance there from, from Aaron McDonald. Um, Bit of bad news, obviously. Palahan lost over uh, by v- rear naked choke at Combat Global. I'd actually like to spend a, a quick minute on this. Um, I feel that Pa's career is being mismanaged by Combat Global. Um, being put in there against a guy like James Gonzalez on short notice, 
it you know the the promotion shouldn't have done that. Fair play to Pat. Pat is always going to take fights like that. But you know, uh, a promising start to combat J Global uh, or Pat Lahan's combat J Global um, experience. But you know, having a tough run of luck there at the minute, and you have to ask yourself, you know, when a promotion like Combat J Global are bringing over a guy like Palahan and some other talent as well from other uh, other ways around the world. Are they looking or do they have his best interests in mind? Um, by the looks of the way things have materialized, last minute pullouts, weight misses, changes of opponent, you'd have to think that they don't have Pa's best interest in it. But uh, hopefully he bounces back. Hopefully he gets back into the win column. But, you know, he... He was doing all right against James Gun- James Gonzalez, but that Gonzalez is a, a really really good fighter, and uh, it was always going to be a tough one, especially at short notice there as well. So, um, you know, it might sound harsh; they may not agree with me, but I think Pash should be looking elsewhere to try and get some competition. Wouldn't he sit in, lads? Wouldn't he sit in well in one of those PFL tournaments there that they're putting on as a lightweight, even the European ranks, and try and feed him maybe into the the other ones or even into the UFC, whatever? But I don't know. I don't feel am I being too harsh there? No, I don't think you're being too harsh. I mean, like, yeah, it's, I didn't even, I didn't even put two and two together. I realized because I was kind of watching it late, and you'd already hear about these Kabashi Club flights until very, very close to them. But like, am I right in saying this? Is the James Gonzalez that was in with James Gallagher, like, yes, a fight ago, yeah, like a short notice. It's not ideal. I'm sure. And like, look, Paz is going to, as you said, he's going to take it, but. Uh, I don't know. It's, I just I don't get Combat Take Global. They seem more concerned about fighting everyone online about Fucking their viewership beats, numbers that's all that he's and all this shit. Like I just don't I don't understand. I don't understand them as an organization. If I'm if I'm honest, and any time that an Irish fighter, it's not even just Bipa. Any time an Irish fighter has been over there, it's it's just never straightforward. So the fact that I was even able to watch this fight was a, a was a positive, which shouldn't be a a a positive to highlight. Um. But yeah, it was a rough five, rough five for Pa in the end. It got dropped in the first round and then and then subbed in the second. Um, and look, he's to be fair, he's had opportunities. He's got to go over and fight in Japan and stuff like that, which is brilliant. Um, but yeah, I don't know. You, you'd like to see someone develop him rather than just kind of like yeah. Well, it, you're getting to the stage. Look, at it worked. It worked for a little bit of time, but then you know you would have to be looking. I'm looking from the outside in. You know what I mean? Is the juice worth the squeeze right now? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, nonetheless, look at Pa will always do what he wants to do and uh, we'll respect that. But those are just my two cents on that matter anyway. Martin McNulty lost a decision against uh, Leopold Guy at Hexagon MMA 16. And to round off the news, unfortunately, we have a pullout on the PFL Europe tournament in the bantamweight division, Franz Malambo no longer taking part in that tournament. Um, issues with visas and residency. And, you know, I'm over in Canada here. I went through all that process. It's a fucking tedious process. Um, couldn't get it over the line in time. That's cost him his run in the tournament. That's cost him, I would say, presumably a, a lot of money. And, you know, it leaves a big question mark over what... Uh, What's next for Franz? You know, he was kind of alluding to the fact he has an album coming out. Congratulations to him for that. Hopefully that uh, flies off the shelves. I'm looking forward to listening to it. I saw a, sl- a little slitter of it on, on his Instagram as well. Um, but yeah, you know, he's, man has had no luck over the last couple of years when it comes to fights and other things that are going wrong. Um, on that same card, uh, obviously we do have Lewis McGrillen versus Matej Sarahovs. Um, Kane Musa will take on Dylan Took. Great fight there as well. D. Begley uh, on the card as well, along with Valentina Scatizzi uh, in the 125 pound tournament there. So lots of Irish interest still on the card, even though Franz is off it. Very excited to see Dylan Took back in action. Obviously, McGrillen, Zarahovs, and D. and Valentina both representing SBGHQ as well in the tournament. Um, I'll be watching with keen eyes. Last but not least, a big title fight for Stephen Costello. Uh, over at F21 um, in Tenerife, out in the sunshine, has the chance to pick up some gold over there. Um, looking forward to seeing that. That fight does take place on June the 2nd. And I'm excited to see how Stephen does in there. He's uh, been having a good year so far. And uh, we'll break down all those. They're a little bit tight for time, obviously enough. We're going to take a closer look at those fights on the next episode of the Owl Triangle. 
And that wraps us up. Thank you to our two guests. Um, thank you to the lads for joining me again to break it down, helping uh, helping the cause of Irish mixed martial arts. Any final t- questions? Any final thoughts? I'm looking at you, Andy Stevenson. Just very, very exciting times. Like I, I, I had but forgotten great, about the PFL Newcastle card when we were talking earlier on about you know the the consecutive uh, you know uh, various different events that are all cropping up. That PFL Newcastle or is it Newcastle? It is Newcastle. PFL yep. Newcastle event. Like that's. That's another Look cracker. Newcastle for, getting all the cards, Cage yeah. Warriors and the PFL. What the hell is going on? Yeah, final thoughts are just. I'm buzzing to see that. I'm. Bu- I'm, I'm honestly. <laughs> I'm reacting in real time here. I'm buzzing to see that card coming up soon. K Musa versus Dylan Took. How can you not like crazy, that fight? Crazy, also, uh, maybe this is a good final thoughts part. I thought it was absolutely beautiful to see. I don't know if you saw this. They they, they must have been doing like a, a two on one interview with someone. I can't. I can't remember. So apologies if it's if if I'm just remem- misremembering someone where both of them were on it and uh, Musa was paying respect to, to Tukes for his, 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 unfortunately his mother passed away there recently, yeah. which obviously our condolences go out to him as well. Um, I, th- I thought that was nice. I just thought it was a really classy touch from Kay Musa. So uh, maybe we'll leave it on that. Maybe we'll leave it on that for... 100%. For I tell you what, we will leave it on. We will leave it on Quilcher de Barra to see us out. Karamila Markov, I'm a slonger for. <laughs>